Welcome to the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government at St. Francis Xavier University. In addition to Mulroney Hall being a state-of-the-art teaching and research complex dedicated to the study of leadership, students and visitors will also find on display an extensive collection of artifacts, photos, and audiovisual material from Mr. Mulroney's time as Canada's 18th Prime Minister, including an exact replica of the Prime Minister's office. The Brian Mulroney Institute of Government offers students an opportunity to learn about and prepare for careers in government, the non-governmental community, and the private sector. With access to generous scholarships and bursaries, students enrolled in the Institute's flagship public policy and governance program are taught about the challenges of leadership and the various factors that have and continue to influence key policy decisions at all levels of government. Well, the public policy and governance program at CNFX is one very few of its kind in Canada. It's a more applied look at politics, examining how public policy is actually made, giving students this amazing springboard into future careers in government, NGOs, law, or really any field that highly values research, writing, and analytical skills. It is Prime Minister Mulroney's hope that students who enter Mulroney Hall will feel inspired to make a positive contribution to the life of our country. The Right Honourable Brian Mulroney Scholarship has had a profound impact on me and my life. I have been able to travel out of province to attend university and it has given me the academic and financial support to further my studies. I've been able to have a research job on campus working with the Mulroney Institute, which has been incredible. I have made amazing friends and peers in my classroom who have helped me learn so much, as well as my professors who have given me so many opportunities in terms of societies and clubs and opportunities on campus that I don't think would have been possible without the scholarship. Recently got to have lunch with the Prime Minister along with some of my other peers. We got to hear stories about his time not only as Prime Minister but as a former St. of X student, which was really cool to hear. He had lots of advice to give us. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr. Andy Haken and I have the privilege of serving as the President and Vice Chancellor of St. Francis Xavier University. I'll begin this afternoon's event with a territorial acknowledgement. At Cinefax, we acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Malostiak, Maliseet peoples, first signed with the British Crown in 1725. We are all treaty people, and making such a statement is viewed as an act of reconciliation. Welcome to the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government Distinguished Speaker Series. This series is designed to engage students, alumni, and the broader community and spark debate on society's most pressing issues. The Mulroney Institute brings together prominent Canadian and international experts to share their unique perspectives on public policy and governance and provide great insight into the thoughts and events that are shaping our times. The host of today's speaker series is Dr. Adam Lajeunesse, who serves as the Irving Shipbuilding Chair in Canadian Arctic Marine Security and as an Assistant Professor in the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. Dr. La Jeunesse works on questions of Arctic sovereignty and security policy. An award-winning author, he has written extensively on Canadian Armed Forces Arctic operations, maritime security, Canadian-American cooperation in the North, and Canadian Arctic history. He's a fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, the Arctic Institute of North America, and the Center for the Study of Security and Development, and sits on the editorial board of the Canadian Naval Review and the journal Arctic. Currently, Dr. Lajeunesse is working on Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funded histories of icebreaker operations in the Canadian Arctic, Northern Development, a circumpolar submarine operations. Adam's teaching is helping to shape Cinefax public policy and governance students into Canada's future and next leaders. Today's very special guest is one of Canada's great leaders. A Cinefax alumnus, 
a graduate of the class of 1959, a true Zaverian, and a tireless supporter of this university, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney, the 18th Prime Minister of Canada. A champion debater during his time at St. Apex, in his first year, Mr. Mulroney was approached by a fellow student, Lowell Murray, a future leader of the government in Senate, and he was asked to join the progressive conservative youth. Mr. Mulroney's membership with the group led to him attending the Federal Leadership Convention in Ottawa, where he met John Diefenbacher, and later to him serving as the Prime Minister in the 1958 Maritime University Student Parliament. There, he squared off against Liberal MP Paul Martin Sr. Also during his time at St. Effects, Mr. Mulroney discovered the work of the Reverend Dr. Moses Cody and the anti ganesh movement. And this helped shape his future policies towards developing nations, including the government's response to the Ethiopian famine, the forgiveness of African debt, and his fight against apartheid in South Africa. The Prime Minister's more than 50 year record of public service is well known. No one is more qualified to speak to us about the current state of politics, both here and abroad, and to offer his great insights on the complex and often disturbing issues currently embracing our world. Let's listen together as the Prime Minister and Adam Lajeunesse discuss the challenge of leadership in turbulent times. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Dr. Haken, for that kind introduction, and to you, Prime Minister, for taking the time to be with us today. Indeed, we have much to thank you for. Uh, for decades now, Prime Minister, you have been one of this university's most steadfast supporters. The Brian Mulroney Institute of Government was established with close to $105 million, raised largely through your own efforts, not to mention millions donated by you personally. I'd like to start certainly by thanking you for your efforts on our behalf, but I'd also like to ask what it is about St. FX that has moved you to such efforts. Adam, uh, St. of X is a special place for me because I came down <clears throat> to uh, Antigonish in, a long time ago now when I was a, I guess I was about 16, from Baycomo, Quebec, which was a tiny paper mill town 450 miles north of Montreal on the St. Lawrence River. And I arrived in Antigonish and I saw this campus with I guess at that time we must have had, I don't know, 1,500 or 2,000 students. And I'd never seen this before. I and mean, for me, it was like arriving in Las Vegas. <laughs> it, was, it was very exciting and brand new. There were debating societies. There were, there were drama societies. There was a Zoverian Weekly. Uh, there, was a, there were political parties of all kinds and uh, great sports activities. So we had a a tremendous opportunity here. And I, I felt that um, after, uh, you know, the graduating, thanks to great professors uh, who not only taught us well, but also inculcated uh, in us values that have remained with, with most of us, if not all, for a lifetime. So and there I met the friends of a lifetime as well at St. of X. Sam Wakeham, who was my roommate over in McNeil, uh, all those years ago, was still my closest friend. We talk all the time. In fact, he, there's just been a scholarship in his name at, uh, at the Mulroney Institute. And so Terry McCann and Jimmy Nasso and uh, Lowell Murray and Paul Crean, and these were people that, that were fantastic students themselves, highly impressive individuals. So I was, uh, I was very, very impressed with it all. I left with my degree, <clears throat> Adam, and went, uh, eventually went off to Montreal. I was recruited by a large uh, law firm there, and I began my career in law. I practiced law for 13 years. And uh, then I uh, was persuaded in 1975, 76, I was persuaded by my, some of my friends to contest the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party when Bob Stanfield retired. Now, I had begun my, my political career with, with Bob Stanfield. My parents uh, were liberals, not very deeply liberal, but they were like all Irish Catholic families in Canada mostly, they supported the Liberal Party. And I came down and I was attracted by the fact that the 
I was persuaded that it was more fun in opposition because the liberals were in power for almost 22 consecutive years federally and, the, and in power for almost 40 years provincially. And Bob Stanfield was in opposition. So I, I joined with him uh, modestly and helped out in the 1960 election. So here I was all those years later and I was being persuaded to run for the leadership of the party, which is what's going on now today. I had not been elected dog catcher, and yet uh, I was persuaded to run, which proves at least one thing, that if you're going to be a le leadership candidate, uh, in my case, the leadership of the conservative, par progressive conservative party at the time, you have to have somebody ask, what do you need to do this? I said, what you need really is a remarkable capacity for self-delusion. So, <laughs> so I, I ran. Uh, and was defeated. I came first on, excuse me, I came second on the first ballot, but I was eventually defeated and I came back to Montreal where I didn't, I, I returned to my law firm, but I, I was um, recruited by the Iron Ore Company of Canada to become president of the company, which I took over at, uh, I guess I was 36 or 37. And it was a company in, in Canada, a big one, with 7,500 employees, uh, which, which was in trouble. So we managed to get it turned around. And um, then about eight or nine years later, uh, the, uh, Joe Clark resigned the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party and called for a leadership convention. And I ran again. And this time, having learned a lot about losing the first time, I, was, I didn't want to do that again. So we managed to win. I still didn't have a seat in the House. And so Elmer McKay, who was the sitting member for Central Nova, uh, very generously volunteered to surrender his seat to me as the leader so I can get into the House of Commons. And so he did that. Uh, Elmer's a great man, great friend of mine. And he became a senior minister in my government for nine years. But uh, so I, I was elected in Central Nova. I spent the the whole summer at Pictou Lodge, campaigning in every nook and cranny of the beautiful riding, and won in August and entered the House of Commons as leader of the opposition uh, with Pierre Trudeau as prime minister. And um, by November, uh, by November, I, we had opened up a lead of about 20 points on, on, on Mr. Trudeau. And uh, so he retired and in came John Turner as prime minister who promptly opened up a lead of 14 points on me. So I, then he called an election, I think hoping to catch us off guard. And uh, we were, I went into the television debates. I think the numbers were, uh, we were 14 points behind. And at a given point in time in the, in the English language debate, Prime Minister Turner made a comment, a statement that allowed me to, to get in there and, and I think give him a, a, a royal drubbing. That event took 41 seconds. And in the 41 seconds, according to the experts and the polling the next days, we went from 14 points behind to 18 points ahead. And it led to the largest victory in Canadian history. Now, What's significant about it is that um, while I was not a parliamentarian or I just had just become a parliamentarian in that debate, I learned, I mean, that thing turned the whole election around, that 41 seconds. And I learned that at St. of X. I learned that in the debates with Ace McCann and uh, Paul Crean and Lowell Murray uh, and Rick Cashin. Cashin was a, from Newfoundland. Rick Cashin was a union leader or he's from Newfoundland, a fantastic debater. And he and I went over to the University of Prince Edward Island. It was called St. Dunstan's in those days. And we took them on and, and we, had a, we had an undefeated season again. Uh, and thanks largely to the talent of people like, uh, like Rick Cashin. So that led to, uh, to uh, the election. Uh, and uh, and, and, and uh, there we are. Well, your time in government has certainly seen quite a bit of um, 
collaboration. And I think you've covered a lot of that. But one of the defining political challenges of our time seems to be the emergence or the hardening of different conceptions of reality, largely based on competing information ecosystems. So we see now in the United States, a large minority of people continue to believe that the 2020 election was stolen. Or in Russia, where state media has convinced many people that Ukrainian Nazis began this current war. What I want to ask you is whether or not you see this as a worsening problem or a continuation of something that's always been a part of politics and how you think leaders can still build consensus and good policy based on shared understandings of reality. Adam, just before I take that on, which is a very pertinent question, um, may I just determine, I was thinking about uh, St. of X and I really haven't answered, fully answered your question. Of course. You know, why St. of X? Well, in this, I, I'm, I'm in Palm Beach now, in my home in Palm Beach. And um, Sean Riley, I, I had done a campaign in 79, 80 for Greg McKinnon when he was president for $7 million. And, and Fred Doucette helped me in that campaign, obviously. He was assistant to the president of the university. And the two of us went off and we raised 12 million for the university. Those numbers seem pretty small today, but in those days, you know, it was pretty important. And, uh, and so when I finished my political career and I went back to business, the first thing that I did when I, when I made a little money was I funded scholarships in my father's name, my late father's name, at St. Effects, the Benedict Mulroney Scholarships. My father was an electrician and he held down two jobs all his life to, to help uh, the family uh, get educated and get out a little bit of Lake Como. And he's the one, um, and, and his statement is on the wall of the, of the Institute. He's the one who told me one night when I told him I was ready to quit and, and help out by taking an apprenticeship job at the paper mill. And he said to me, Brian, you know, you're right, we really need the money here. But um, I've learned one thing, and that the only way out of a paper mill town is through a university door and you are going to university. And that's how I wound up at St. of X. So I owed St. of X. You know, some people tell you, well, you know, how did you, how did you be successful? Oh, I did it on my own. I was a real smart aleck. I, I did not. The fact of the matter, in my experience, no one does it on his own or her own. We all need a helping hand from time to time. And you have to be, if you've succeeded in whatever your career choice was, you should give back and help out. And my uh, affection and respect for, for the region and for the people I met, and what have you. In fact, I, I, I love the area so much that even to today, I'm looking around at maybe building a, a home on the water and outside of Antigonish or Marigamish and, uh, and teaching at the university and lecturing there, living part-time there and maybe part-time down here kind of thing. Uh, but but that's how deeply uh, affected I was by my experience at St. of X. And so when Sean Riley and Tim Lang showed up here uh, a number of years ago now and asked me if I had had a campaign to raise $25 million for the university, <clears throat> I first said no, and then they persuaded Sean, was very persuasive, convinced me to, to do it. And uh, that campaign lasted a number of years. We, we didn't have a big infrastructure at St. of X. Uh, the campaign really was, um, was me out knocking on doors with a tin cup and uh, my daughter Caroline helping me. Frank McKenna gave me great help. And uh, the uh, other, Sam Wakem, others as well who helped out uh, during the course of the campaign. But we wound up at a given point in time, I wound up with, um, oh, I'm coming back. I got to put, tell you this, I'm coming back from Nelson Mandela's funeral on the prime minister's private aircraft. And one of the people, the invited guests there was Stephen McNeil, the premier of Nova Scotia, whom I, I did not know. And so he and I sat down and had a great time talking Nova Scotia politics. And, um, at, and I told him about St. of X and, <clears throat> and what we were trying to do to build Mulroney Hall and the Institute and scholarships and that. 
<clears throat> he never said a word. And then we'll, as we were getting off the plane in Ottawa, he, uh, in, in totally unsolicited manner, and in, in very kind and generous, uh, he was, and a great premier. I thought it turned out to be a great premier. He said to me, out of the blue, I'll give you five, Nova Scotia will give you $5 million. And we're delighted that you're building, uh, spending that money in Nova Scotia, not in Montreal or Toronto. Uh, so that led to a situation where I kept raising money <clears throat> at a given point, excuse me, at a given point in time, I called the prime minister, Mr. Trudeau. And I said, I'd like to see her for lunch. And he said, fine. So we met in Montreal at the Sheraton Hotel. And uh, we had lunch and I made my pitch for St. of X. And, I, and what impressed him, you know, you, Andy talked about uh, Moses Cody. That affected me a great deal. But this, this university was built, I think, about 165 years ago by poor farmers and fishermen and clergy from Glasgow to Cape Breton. They built the university. And some people say that, you know, you don't have to give back. Well, you do. You've got to give back. And uh, so I'm sitting there with, uh, with Trudeau in this background. And he knew a lot about it, too. And um, I, he said, well, what, what do you need? I said, well, I need between to conclude this. He said, how much have you raised? I said, I've raised $65 million from the private sector. He said, wow. He said, usually people come to see us for the first money, and then they try and raise money after. <laughs> I said, well, we tried it with St. of X, we did it this way. He said, how much do you need? I said, I need between 25 and $30 million. He thought for a while, he looked at his documents, and he said to me, well, O'Brien, my government will give you $30 million. That's how we wound up with $105 million but all told it now to about 125 million. So this gave us the scholarships, it gave us the complete refurbishing of Nicholson Hall, it created the Mulrooney Hall at a cost of about $50 million, and then the Institute. Uh, so it was a major investment in St. X. But in many ways for the generous donors that we have, you know, some people think in universities, well, you know, we have to be, we shouldn't raise money from the private sector. We should get it from the governments. Governments can't afford it anymore. We have to go out and raise money. Otherwise, our great university research institutions and, and scholarship students, all of these great initiatives are gonna atrophy in front of our very eyes. So <clears throat> that was the story of, the, <clears throat> of that final campaign to raise money for St. of X that we're really talking about today. Now with regard to um, the important question you asked me, um, look, there's polarization like I've never seen before in the United States and indeed in Canada. Just look at the way that the federal conservative leadership campaign has started. A candidate announces that he's going to run and his opponent immediately attacks him personally. Another candidate announces he's going to run. He is attacked frontally. This is the politics of personal destruction. I never believed in that. I never practiced it. I was a strong partisan. And I held my own in debates and, and political fights. I won two general elections. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I'm no innocent at the party. I, uh, I, I had my share of tough fights. That said, you do not have to seek to destroy a woman or a man and their families when they're trying to serve Canada. So the same disastrous political situation that you see in Washington, where no one talks to each other, to, to the other, there's no communication, the Republicans hate the Democrats and, and back and forth, the same thing is happening here in Canada. And this is a, this is a recipe for complete paralysis. And I think that it dishonors our politics and it dishonors the legacy of a great country like Canada. Uh, you know, this was built by hardworking people, for example, from, from Antigonish Guysborough, from Central Nova. Uh, this was 
was done. Uh, and look, I mentioned Sean Fraser, who's now the Minister of Immigration. Look, what, what's going on? This, this idea that he had, this fantastic idea, which is going to bring possibly thousands and thousands of jobs to Atlantic Canada. Why? Because he had the idea and he was ready to fight for it. There's a constructive attitude. That's what we all should be doing in politics. But we've been taken over, we've been hijacked. Our politics has been hijacked by the sad, I think, um, intrusion of brutality into the politics of America. And now our people feel that they have to do the same thing. They don't. And I'll bet you a lot of money right now that uh, the guy who wins the next election is the fellow with a grand vision for the future of Canada in important areas to families and children and grandchildren. That's the guy or the woman who's going to win. None of this garbage politics. And so I, I, if, if I were asked for an opinion, which I suppose I am, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would say to, to whomever in any party, Look for the high road, articulate a grand vision for the future of Canada, and stay on the high road from beginning to end. Well, Prime Minister, it is heartening to hear a former Conservative Prime Minister sitting down for lunch with a current Liberal Prime Minister, hmm. praising a Liberal Cabinet Minister. I think that is the kind of bipartisanship that we'd like to continue to develop, and hopefully in several more decades we can continue to see that kind of uh, cooperation in and out of retirement. Unfortunately, brutality in politics isn't what's leading the headlines these days. Obviously, what we're watching in the Ukraine is at the front of almost everyone's mind and is one of the country's most pressing policy problems in a number of different areas. 1991, Canada, under your leadership, actually became the first Western state to officially recognize Ukrainian independence. So obviously today that independence and Ukraine's very existence is at threat of being extinguished. What do you believe that Canada could or, or should be doing for the Ukraine that we're not already? Well, uh, because in 1991, I guess it was, I recognized my government became the first, as you say, to recognize the independence of Ukraine. And one of the, and George Bush, and, and President Gorbachev tried to talk me out of it, <clears throat> excuse me, for different reasons. Gorbachev told me that this would signal uh, the decomposition of the Soviet Union. And that, I mean, I got along very well with Gorbachev. I admired him and so on. I didn't want it, him to come to any harm. But, I, but as I said to him, look, Mikhail, I've got 1.4 million Canadians of Ukrainian heritage, the largest diaspora. Ukrainian diaspora in the world outside of Russia. And so they've been fighting for independence and wanting independence their entire lives and generations and generations. So I'm not going to go ahead. And George Bush had a different reason. George Bush was in favor of it, but the timing did not uh, concord with his uh, view of what would, would happen in Eastern and Central Europe. So, so I said to both of them, no, I'm going to do it. Uh, because uh, the Ukrainians in Canada and elsewhere deserve uh, our respect and we deserve our special attention at this moment. So, so we did it. And so now, here we have today an unprovoked criminal war by murderous thugs in Moscow uh, pretending to be senior statesmen. And they're not at all, they're war criminals, what they're doing, killing babies and women and children and men, soldiers, blowing, the, blowing up uh, uh, apartment buildings, hospitals, orphanages, for God's sake. This, uh, this has never been seen in, 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 in Europe in 80 years. And here we are in this year of a new century, and by God, they're back at it again. So what uh, I... I anguish over it particularly because I see that um, that independence that we recognize for Ukraine is now being today being stripped away bullet by bullet, tank by tank, uh, death by death. 
And I think that uh, the Russian objective here, Putin's objective is pretty clear. Right? You know, he wants to resurrect the uh, he wants to resurrect the Russian Empire. There are certainly large parts of it. He wants one language in the former Russian Empire, one language, one religion, and one leader himself forever. This is what we're up against. There's not the slightest suggestion of democracy there. So Canada, uh, I think, has done a good job in this area. I was more enthused myself about uh, a no-fly zone or some semblance of that, a no-fly to protect Ukrainians on the ground, some kind of air cover. But, but look, I'm no longer in the information and the intelligence flow at the highest levels of government. There are things going on of which I would, of course, be unaware. So I don't want, and of course, a no-fly zone could provoke the Russians into doing something calamitous. Um, I don't think so, but as I say, I'm not privy to all of this specialized information anymore. And, and those who are say that we can go as far as we can, but we shouldn't have a, a no-fly zone. Now, I conveyed, as I do, my, my and when we we're doing the NAFTA negotiations or what have you, I conveyed to the government of Canada my strong impressions of what had to be done in Ukraine. And I gave it to senior cabinet ministers some time ago. And I must say, uh, and I, I prefer to do that than to be out criticizing any guy. You know, Monday morning quarterbacks, we don't need them. You know, and certainly people who don't have an appreciation of the burdens that the prime minister and his colleagues bear in trying to make these decisions and try to help Ukraine. It's not, it's not an easy thing. Now that said, uh, I think that the, the governments, and I should say President Biden as well, he gets a lot of criticism, but Joe Biden, whom I've known for 35 years when he was president of the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we did a lot of work. I did a lot of work with him. And it's the old Irish thing as well. I did a lot of work with him on various files. And, he, and I, like, I like him a lot. Uh, and he's getting a lot of criticism, but I think that his diplomatic initiatives uh, have the unity that he's brought to NATO, the force that he's brought to, to NATO, and the strength of the restrictions placed upon, uh, upon the Russians and the oligarchs and everybody. This economy of Russia is in a state of collapse. And I think the governments are doing the right thing. Look, an army marches not on its belly, on money. You have to have the funds to do what's going on. The economy of Russia is smaller with four, 144 million people, is smaller than that of Canada with 38 million people. In fact, if you want to look at it another way to put it in perspective, in the month of January, the United States of America produced more goods and services in that 30 days, then Russia will produce all year long up until the 1st of January next year. This is not a strong, this is not a, a 10 foot giant that we're looking at. The pressures that are being put on the economy. Look, the bank, the, the bank can, the central bank cannot open. The banks cannot open. You can't get your money out. Why? Because the, the ruble is now worth one penny, one cent US. And so you've got millions of people now who are going to realize what, what uh, Putin has done to, the, to them, to their economy. They don't have a clue what's going on in Russia, by and large, because they've shut off. There's, there's no democracy. So they, he shut down all of the instruments uh, for the conveyance of information. So the poor Russian people. They don't have a clue what's going on. But I'll tell you, they're going to have a clue when all of a sudden investment completely disappears. Goods and services are no longer available. And the, and the government can no longer pay the salaries. Now, one thing, Adam, that, that should be of interest is the role of China in this. 
one thing that might happen here is that the Chinese arrange things in, in such a way that they, they have a client-state relationship with Russia. They provide cash and they provide support in this difficult period. And in return, uh, Russia inevitably enters into a subservient relationship with China to supply uh, agricultural products, wheat, mining products, nickel, iron ore, you name it, even electricity uh, at the, from the uh, most eastern end down by Vladivostok to China. Uh, so they become a supplier of goods and services in a, in a, in a very subordinate manner to China. And this, this then creates an alliance that uh, we don't want to see. And so that'll have to be dealt with. But I guess the quick answer to your question, again, is that I think the governments are doing well, the Western governments. I wish to hell we could do something that would keep those planes out of the sky. But I, I realize the argument against. But every time I see one of these poor women being shot, holding a baby in her arms, and the baby dies, this is, look, these guys are all going to wind up before the war crimes panels in The Hague. They're, and look at all the former leaders who are in jail from Yugoslavia and Africa and so on, who are all in jail for the rest of their lives. This is what's going to happen to this crowd. And, and because they are war criminals for what they're doing, it's unforgivable. And, and, and now, this ends in, in, in one of three ways. Ukraine wins. Russia wins, or there's a negotiated settlement. And my guess is that they're going to negotiate a settlement in the next few days or the next few weeks, which will result in a, in a different situation, probably Ukraine agreeing to become a neutral nation and not to seek uh, membership in NATO, and also not to accept uh, NATO um, armaments on their territory and, the, uh, and to do some kind of recognition, uh, some, the façon boiteuse, as they would say, uh, in the eastern provinces. The, and, and, um, and Russia uh, has to have a ceasefire, withdraw immediately, and uh, sign a peace treaty that is guaranteed by the United States and NATO and the European Union. Something like that, my guess is that that is what is going to happen. Because if Putin thought, and he did, this was going to be a walk in the park. He was going to be in and out of there in 48 hours. He was going to install a puppet government in Kiev, uh, shoot the rest of them, and have this puppet respond to him in Moscow. He got the surprise of his bloody life, and the courage of the Ukrainians, and the and the effectiveness of their battles and, and the eloquence of their president, their young president. This has been a wonder to behold. And uh, they may have, they may have, thought, have fought this great power with nuclear arms to a standstill. And you can bet a lot of money that if Putin, whom I first knew, in, when he was deputy mayor of Leningrad, when I do official visits to the Soviet Union at the time when Gorbachev was in power, you can be sure that if he is suing for peace, he knows that uh, he made a very, very unwise decision and he better get the hell out of there as fast as he can. Well, Prime Minister, I think all of our viewers hope with you that this war ends very quickly and that it ultimately ends with Vladimir Putin and many of his cronies in The Hague. If, however, you're right, and I think yeah, you very good chance of that, that we see a negotiated settlement in the very near future, the impacts from this invasion are going to still be very long lasting, both for the European security dynamic and the global economy. To my mind, Russia has reemerged now as a competitor, a partner, as, as an adversary or an enemy, as opposed to just a competitor. 
And so we've got Western nations scrambling to increase their defense budgets and to diversify their energy supplies. So over the long term, over 10 or 20 years, what can Canada do to adapt to this new economic and geopolitical reality? Well, economically, we've got to uh, articulate the need for a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. We've got to rebuild that country and that's going to take, well, look, the, the Western democracies rebuilt uh, Europe after the war. That, that's why you have Germany and France in such impressive positions today. We've got to do the same thing with Ukraine and make certain that they're back on their, on, on their feet. Um, we also uh, have to, in Canada, we've got to start, um, you know, meeting our, honoring our commitments. We have a commitment to spend 2% of GDP on uh, defense. And I'm almost ashamed to tell you as a Canadian that the last government that met that 2% commitment was mine all those years ago. It shouldn't be. I had it at 2% and it's gone steadily downhill like this. And so as John, John, we get ridiculed and around the world for, for the weakness of our defense, which we've just seen, you know, we, we don't have the military clout that we should have. Um, and as John Manley, who was the, the, uh, the liberal uh, Minister of Finance and also Minister of Foreign Affairs, talking about the situation that obtained when he was there. He said, you know, when we're at an international meeting and the bill comes around, Canada gets up and goes to the washroom. Well, this is not a pretty picture for a great country like ours. So that has to be correct. Our commitment at the United Nations has to be enhanced as well. We keep getting defeated for seats on the Security Council. Two successive governments in Canada have had that happen. This is very demeaning. We're one of the founders, one of the great players at the United Nations. Lester Pearson, for God's sake, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his idea for peacekeeping in the Middle East in, in Suez in 1956. So the, we have a, a large and, and golden legacy Canada has in foreign affairs. We got to get back into it again. And so we, we've got to, you know, the government has got to, nationally it's got a big program it has to do. Uh, and, you know, they'll, they'll select their own uh, policies. I have, if I were there, which uh, thank God I'm not, uh, I would, uh, I'd have my own ideas. Uh, but they need to do big things and they have to articulate for Canadians a grand vision of where this country, they think this country is going to be in five and 10 years. And what will the benefits be for ordinary Canadians trying to pay their bills and accommodate these rise in prices? And there will be rises in, in interest rates for their mortgages and so on. And what kind of environment, what kind of environment are they gonna leave? They have to leave a pristine environment. I think this beautiful area that you're in right there, Nova Scotia, I mean, is there anything nicer in Canada than, than Eastern Nova Scotia? Of course not. This has to be maintained as a pristine uh, gift to the children and grandchildren of the residents of, of, that, of all, all of Central Nova and of course of Nova Scotia itself. So they've got a big agenda, but you know, with, with political will and the, the courage to take big ticket items and, and run with them and fight for them, you can do big things in Canada. Well, I think all eyes are on Russia, as we've been talking about. That really seems to be uh, the confrontation that is capturing the world's attention. However, as you know, there is a broader global struggle between authoritarianism and democracy, seemingly to determine which will define the 21st century. China, as much as Russia, is at the heart of that. How does Canada need to balance its economic engagement with China with its growing concerns over regional security and human rights within China itself, Prime Minister? Well, China, of course, is a different kettle of fish. You're no longer dealing with an, an anemic economy like that of Russia. You're talking and with 144 million people. You're talking about a country with a billion five almost 
uh, with an economy uh, that it, according to the experts will surpass that of the United States of America in, in, in total production uh, by certainly by 2040. That's the, I'm not sure of that. I mean, America remains a highly productive, ingenious, uh, remarkable nation capable of generating wealth like we've never, the world has never seen. Well, I'm not so sure of that, but in any case, China is a force to be dealt with. And I can remember being there with, um, with uh, the, the, pre the president of, uh, of China years ago uh, when um, uh, the great, you know, the great uh, leadership divisions were healed and all of a sudden China was modernized and it started on this fantastic growth period. Um, in those days, the growth was to take people out of poverty and to elevate them to the middle class. And they did that successfully over many years uh, with um, three to 400 people, if not more, being raised out of poverty and now functioning in able members of, of China's middle class, highly productive people, as you know. But you know, the attitude has changed. It's no longer the, the attitude of let's, let's get ahead, let's help our people, let's build prosperity, let's build alliances, let's be a good neighbor, and so on. No, now in the South China Seas, they're building islands down there. They got their eye on Taiwan, of course, and any hint of weakness in the presidency of the United States or elsewhere brings on an urgent request uh, from Taiwan for more help because they feel the Chinese are gonna to do to them what they did in Hong Kong. When Margaret Thatcher signed in 1984, when Margaret signed the, uh, the, the treaty that allowed the, uh, and understandably so, that allowed the Chinese to come in and take over with the promise that would always be the same. Well, look what happened. It's no longer the same, and it's not gonna be the same in Taiwan. They're in the South China Seas, building those islands, but also claiming ownership of international waters that belong to the Philippines and, and Vietnam and Cambodia and all of these places. And the Chinese are being the schoolyard bully there. Now, so what do we do? Well, what, we, we, what does Canada do? We don't have a China policy. I have strongly urged and publicly in that case uh, that the Minister of Foreign Affairs convene a special blue ribbon uh, panel that will articulate and develop a new policy for, for, for China. It has to be based on the concepts of engagement and, and, and mutual prosperity. We can't disengage from China. That'd be silly, simply because they're doing things we disapprove of. Because there's been no hostility um, between us and the Chinese, except for that foolish, their foolish decision to kidnap two of our people off the streets in Beijing and throw them in the slammer for no reason at all. And that's why at that time I took the position that the only way that we're going to get this back is when the American president lays the wood to them and we keep saying that we are not going to engage in a swap. We are going to respect our international extradition treaties and let the American courts deal with it, but we cannot be a sovereign nation agreeing to a treaty and then, then uh, abrogating the treaty simply because we want to engage in a swap. That's the, the wrong way to do it. The way it was done, I think was the right way. And again, I think that uh, the Foreign Affairs Department and the Prime Minister and his colleagues, they deserve credit for that. Our guys came home and we didn't have to abandon our honor in, in the process. But look, dealing with the Chinese, and I had the, I guess I would say the privilege of dealing with them for nine years while I was Prime Minister. And then in many, many occasions since, business transactions and official visits and so, and so on. Uh, they've always, always treated me well. They're very courteous, thoughtful, quite generous people. But there's a new leadership concept that's taken over. And is that we have to throw, almost we have to throw our weight around. Well, they don't. They can be extremely productive leaders in the next century, uh, getting to the next century as well if they modify their attitude and say, hey, 
we got a lot of power. We got a lot of people. We have a lot of money. And let's cooperate. Let's not be engaged in hostilities. Let's cooperate with the United States, with Europe, with Canada, and so on. I think we can do a lot more of that because we don't have a, we don't have a choice. And actually, nor do they. Nor do they. And our engagement, because of our very good association with China over so many years. I mean, I got to compliment Peter Trudeau, who was an opponent of mine. He recognized China at a very early moment. That's not forgotten. Norman Bethune is still revered in China. Uh, they, they, they remember acts of kindness and respect. We have a good, we have a lot of a reservoir of goodwill. We should use that to re-engage with Chinese pursuant to the development of that, that paper, that new policy that will come out of the Blue Ribbon Panel, chaired by Madame Joly at Foreign Affairs, and all of a sudden, we're back in business. Um, and, but, but you know, I'll just conclude on this. When we were in a, in a dilemma like this with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was, it was a bipolar world at the time, and the Soviet Union was the other big power, the United States. What happened was that we got together and all of the industrialized nations in the world committed to accept and respect the leadership of President Reagan while he dealt with the Soviet Union. So when he went to speak to Gorbachev, or the, he was able to say, I'm not alone here. I'm speaking for 60% of the GDP of the entire world and most of the military assets that exist there. So Ronald Reagan, because there was complete solidarity and support, as the leader of the free world, in dealing with the Soviet leaders, we were, he was able, we were able, all of us together, to end the Cold War without a shot being fired. And that came from the solidarity of the allies in supporting the president of the United States. President Biden has to get that support, and he's got to deliver that message to China. And my guess is that if that happens, I don't know if it'll, the matter will be resolved entirely, but I tell you what, Adam, I think that we're going to make some mighty strides because what they respect is power and influence and achievement. And this block of people being spoken, being led by the President of the United States would be remarkable. Well, Prime Minister, we're certainly seeing echoes from your time in office with current policy issues, both in defense and foreign affairs. Fortunately, we're also seeing echoes in the financial areas as well. One of the greatest challenges that you faced during your time in office was a stubborn budget deficit. In the wake of COVID-19, we face an unprecedented deficit with no shortage of crucial issues that are going to demand government resources going forward. I guess the question very simply is how Canada should approach its finances and what we as a country need to prioritize in this environment. Well, you're quite right. I mean, one of the nightmares I inherited was the largest deficits are measured as a percentage of GDP. I inherited from Pierre Trudeau, the largest deficit in the history of Canada, 8.7% of GDP, the largest until this one now, but at the time. I also inherited uh, a debt, a national debt, that had been increased by 1,100% over the Trudeau period. Mm -hmm. So this was a nightmare for us to deal with. We finally, in spite of the, the problems that we had, we reduced the deficit by a third. Um, the Fraser Institute reported um, that since 1870, there were two governments in Canadian history who did not increase public spending per capita, but had a three-tenths of 1% decline in public spending over their mandates. My government was one of them, and Jean Chrétien's was the other. And so it was a hell of a fight to get this done. When I came in, the government of Canada was spending a dollar and 23 cents for every dollar it received in taxes. When I left, it was, we, were, we were spending 97%, 97 cents 
for every dollar we received in taxes. It was a tough, tough go, and it was a nightmare for us all along. And so, but here's the kicker. At the time, apart from that deficit and the debt, we also inherited a situation where interest rates averaged 16%. Now, that's a very key component in what Mr. Trudeau, Justin, now has to do. And that is that he, he's gotten uh, funding at recently at 1%. 2%, 3% it's going to be with the rises that are going to occur. That's a long, long way from 16%, or in one case, 22.7% that we went through in the 80s. This was a calamitous fiscal situation we inherited. People, people don't recognize how brutal it was to try and govern with that vote. Michael Wilson was a fabulous uh, finance minister. And we brought in free trade, we brought in NAFTA, and we brought in uh, the GST. These were indispensable, and we, we privatized a lot, and we, we uh, got rid of the National Energy Program and, and things like that. We did a lot of, a lot of major things that uh, leveled the playing field and put us back in business. Uh, you know, uh, for example, in NAFTA, it, with, with regard to international trade, which is so vital, and I was uh, very happy to work with the, the Liberal government on renewing NAFTA. And why? Well, NAFTA uh, today is a grouping of three friendly countries uh, with 500 million people. They're 7% of the world's population. And with that 7%, we produce 28% of the world's wealth every year. This is, this is pretty good going. This is a good deal for Canada. In fact, it took 120 years for Canada to generate in US dollars, the GDP of almost $600, $600 billion. With free trade and NAFTA, it took 30 years to triple it to $1.8 trillion a year for Canada. So if you do, the, if you have the, 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 the team that's willing to make the sacrifice and the political sacrifice, because believe me, the GST <clears throat> was the most unpopular tax in the history of Christendom. And, and I, was, I bore the brunt of the, of the attacks. I've got all the scars uh, today to, to prove it. Uh, but you know, if you look at it today, others said they were gonna abolish it and get rid of it. They were gonna get rid of NAFTA, they're gonna get rid of free trade. It's all still there, why? because these were the fundamental structural changes that we Canada had to have happen to the economy to put it in a position today that will allow Justin Trudeau to deal with this extraordinary deficit and national debt in a much easier manner than we did because interest rates are, are very, very low relative to where we were. Interest rates are low and uh, economic growth is gonna bounce back very strongly. And so there's gonna be a lot of money coming into the treasury. And if it's wisely prioritized and spent, uh, we'll be out of the bushes uh, probably in 10, 12 years, which is not long in the, in the life of a nation. Well, Prime Minister, those of us with mortgages do hope that we don't return to 22.8%. No. You mentioned NAFTA. So I'll, I'll move to a question that one of our students asked actually, and that is, uh, while this is an overwhelmingly popular agreement, polls are fairly uh, conclusive on that in Canada, it is still contentious, certainly in, in places. And having gone through a very contentious negotiating process with the United States very recently, our minds should probably look forward to the next such round of negotiations. So the question is that looking back and forward, what would you have done differently to negotiate that first agreement? And then what should we as a country be focused on and concerned with the next time that comes up for discussion? Well, the first one, of course, was the Canada-US free trade agreement that I did with President Reagan. And uh, that uh, increased our trade uh, by 300%, and created millions of jobs in Canada. We had a, a, new, a unique access to the most dynamic and prosperous economy in the world, namely the United States. 
And the GST was ne a necessary component because buried in the products in those days was a 13 and a half percent manufacturer's sales tax. It was secret, nobody knew about it, but no government wanted to remove it because it would, it, it, you'd have to then re replace it with a visible tax. But that product, that 13 and a half percent tax on our trade and our exports going into the United States made them uncompetitive. As soon as they hit the border, it's 13 and a half percent more as it was for us in Canada. The GST was a replacement tax of 7% when I was there, it's now five, 7%. The GST came off at the, at the border. It was a consumption tax. So it didn't follow the product into the United States. So back in Sellerton or Mississauga, where, where plants were being built, employment went from say 11 people in some small plants to 1100 because the hell there's a place in Montreal was selling suits, became the largest suit manufacturer in the world. Peerless, I think it's called peerless clothing. And, and hundreds and thousands of employees uh, were, were taken on because of the export capacity of Canada that was so strongly enhanced by the Canada United States Free Trade Agreement. And then with the addition of Mexico and the US and Canada uh, by, by NAFTA. Well, what we're gonna have to do the next time is make damn sure that we renew it. And you can see how difficult it was uh, the last time because people see how, how well Canada is doing by this and, and, and some politicians, protectionists, and we won't name anybody, but protectionists and provincialists, they want us to stop this, but you can't, stop the world and say, I'm going to get off. The world's going towards globalization, towards fr freer and freer trade. And we have got to start protecting our intellectual property. We've got to start protecting artificial intelligence. We've got to start protecting the high technologies industries. We've got to be part of that because that's the way we're going to grow with the help of all of our universities, with the help of the research that's going on in our major universities across Canada. You put them together, and we've got a package deal, and certainly sometimes in niche markets that will allow us to create, continue to create the thousands and thousands of jobs that Nova Scotia and, and the rest of Canada needs. Another thing that they've got to do while they're doing this, the Canada's population, and, and this is an area where Sean Fraser is deeply involved as Minister of Immigration. Thank the Lord he's there because he knows what the nature of the of the problems and the challenges. We've got to increase the population of Canada from 38 million to 75 million over a reasonable period of time, and hopefully 100 million. Otherwise, we're going to get left behind in the demographic, uh, the demographic uh, growth patterns of the world. And we don't want to be, a, uh, as they say in Quebec, a, a toothpick. We don't want to be a, a toothpick. We want to be a, remain a vigorous, powerful, much admired nation around the world. And to do that, we gotta bring in immigrants. And we've gotta have policies that encourage young families in, 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 in the demographic area. And so these are some of the vital challenges that Canada faces. And um, they're not easy. And, and you're gonna to have to break down prejudices and, and hostilities and so on. But that's what a prime minister is for. You don't get elected, prime minister's not elected for popularity. He's elected to provide leadership. As Bill Clinton said so well, leadership is the capacity to look around the corner of history just a little bit. And if the prime minister looks around the corner of history a little bit, he's gonna see these various challenges. Some of them, if he accepts them, will make him very unpopular. That's what he's there for. That's what he's there for, to provide leadership. And, and if, he, if that's his attitude, uh, then, um, you know, he's, he, you know, Canadians uh, have to be told not what they want to hear, but what they have to know. And what they have to know is that if there's no vision, as it's said over the Parliament Bill, isn't that uh, where there's no vision, then the nation will perish. Well, we won't perish but we're certainly going to fall behind 
unless the government of Canada identifies, Parliament of Canada, I should say, identifies and agrees to accept the challenges that require courage and leadership and vision, and sometimes a lot of unpopularity to make it happen. Once it's happened, you know, uh, then Canada benefits. And that should be the only, I used to tell my caucus and my camp, here, we're coming with a controversial piece of legislation. All right, here's the criteria. Is this good for Canada? Down the line. If it is, we're going to do it. Irrespective of the unpopularity of the challenge, we're going to do it. If it's not, we're not going to do it. Because I want to govern not for easy headlines in 10 days, but for a better Canada in 10 years. That's what we tried to do. We paid the price and look, we didn't, we didn't get it right um, all the time. I've made more than my share of mistakes uh, in both in politics and in life and so on. But you know, nothing's perfect. And uh, hindsight is um, always uh, 2020. Uh, so you, what you do is you have your, your agenda and you proceed in the belief that the implementation of your agenda will benefit the ordinary Canadians in the longer haul. Well, Prime Minister, let's close with our last question, and it's a fairly open-ended one. In September, the Conservative Party of Canada is going to pick its new leader, and the choices, as you've mentioned earlier, are very different visions for what the party could or, or should be. I'd like to give you the opportunity to offer any thoughts on the future of the party that you once ran. Well, you know, when I, when I watch it, my, uh, one question comes to mind, Adam. You think it's too late for a comeback? <laughs> oh, God, you'd have to be out of your mind to think that. To think that. But no, uh, look, uh, they've got good candidates who've announced. Uh, Paul Yev is a, is a very bright, uh, uh, very effective member of the opposition in the House of Commons. And he's got a long history in the party. Uh, Jean Charest uh, has been a very successful premier of Quebec, and he was a successful member of my government, senior cabinet minister, minister of environment, a very attractive guy and a great campaigner. He's, he's a great candidate. Patrick Brown is probably the best organizer in Canada, the mayor of Brampton. He used to be leader of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, and others that I, I, don't know, I don't know so far. But these are, uh, these are three uh, outstanding people. Now, the question that they have to answer and the party has to answer, do you want a candidate who can win a convention or do you want a candidate who can win an election? There's a big difference. There's a big, big difference in that regard. And um, we, we went through earlier uh, how you win elections. And, and if you don't win, you may be a nice guy, and you may, but if you win the convention, it's fine. You've got Storno, you can live in Storno, they give you a car and a driver, that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I'll give you an appalling, uh, really an appalling little statistic. Someone once wrote in analyzing political leaders that I, Brian, they, the question was, you know, time in office. Brian Mulroney alone has given the, the Conservative Party more time in office than all leaders combined in the previous 58 years. Now, what does that tell you? Well, it tells me uh, that um, if you want to be a, a Conservative leader who becomes Prime Minister, you've got a campaign with the broad middle class in mind. There are no victories on the extremes. You can't win from the left wing and you can't win from the far right wing. It's just not doable. Canadians are not like that. But you can win if you present a moderate, thoughtful policy uh, as the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. If these leaders, whomever wins the convention, adopts that kind of attitude and that kind of policy in all areas, foreign affairs, 
financial matters, social policy, you know, then, then he's going to win. I, I, watching American presidents, and I've known 10 American presidents, and I worked very closely, intimately with three, President Reagan, President Bush, and President Clinton. And I, watching them, I finally figured out that to be a successful American president, and you can probably say the same thing about a prime minister, but to be a successful American president, as I watched them all so intimately and so closely for so many years, you got to have two things. You got to have substance and you got to have style. If you're a doer, mean spirited, vindictive person, you can have the best policies in the world, but Canadians are not going to vote for you. Same thing is true in the United States. But people argue down here, I'm in Palm Beach. President Trump is down the street here, uh, and people argue, supporters will tell me, you know, uh, President Trump did a great job in substance. They like his policies and taxation and trade and so on. But they, uh, we wish he could stay the hell off Twitter and stop insulting people. You know, it's a small thing, but in the mind of an independent voter or a woman in the, a young woman in the suburbs, Philadelphia or what have you, or Toronto in Etobicoke, they don't like that stuff. And unless political leaders understand uh, that that's where the country is, uh, and for the conservatives, well, how are they going to, here, here's a question for the next leader. The three biggest cities in Canada are Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. We didn't win a seat in the last couple of elections in Montreal. We didn't win a seat in Toronto, and we won a small handful in Vancouver. Now, how are you going to form a majority government with that kind of situation? So all it means is that, that the candidates are going to have to understand that Canada is not the country of 1945. It's a different country, with a different population, and uh, and so uh, and all immigrants, you know, I, there's never been a wave of immigration in Canada that has not brought honor to this country. Be it the Irish, the, 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 the Jews, the Ukrainians, the Poles, the Italians, every wave of immigration which has built our country has brought honor and prosperity uh, uh, to, to, our, to our country. That's a new reality that we have now. The demographic makeup of Canada has shifted. So we better get with the program. If you want to, you want to be prime minister, you better get with the program. It is a modern, sophisticated, highly impressive, and quite wonderful country we have. And you better be able to understand it and to deal with it and to lead it properly. Thank you, Prime Minister. I share your hopes for a thoughtful and cooperative government, as I think do we all. I believe that's all the time that we have today, though. Uh, this has been a truly enlightening conversation. And on behalf of the entire audience, let me express our gratitude for your taking the time to speak to the university, our students, and guests. I think we're seeing more and more the cyclical nature of so many Canadian public policy challenges that we've talked about today. And the opportunity to learn from your experience has been invaluable. So let me thank you as well. Uh, let me thank you again. And of course, thank our audience for joining us. And to them, I would say, please be sure to watch the Mulroney Institute website for forthcoming events, including our ongoing Distinguished Speaker Series. Take care. Thank you very much, Adam, for having me. I'm honored to be with you and be able to talk to so many students and friends of the university. St. of X is a great university, and we all have to contribute to make it that way for the coming decades and for coming waves of students, new generations. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and my very best wishes to all of your viewers today. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister.